Hi, Bob Hughes here with JD Squared. I really appreciate you taking time out to view the video. Anyway, what I'm gonna be talking about is the XR6 rotary cutter that you see behind me. Um, it, it basically, a lot of people hear rotary cutter, they think plasma. We're cutting round tubing or possibly square um, with a plasma torch. The XR6, however, was actually designed as a member of our new extreme platforms. So it isn't limited to just plasma cutting. It will, for instance, uh, wood carve. I can make, I can make a, a pretty good size carve, and I think about 10 inch diameter wood carving like exotic columns, things like that. Uh, we can mill PVC um, pipe. We can mill PVC, um, I'm sorry, aluminum tubing and pipe. In other words, we don't plasma cut it, we actually mill it. Now, of course, we could plasma cut, we can draw, we can scribe, we can cut flat material, we could route flat material. So the machine has a tremendous amount of capabilities, and I'm going to be doing individual videos actually showing you the cutting process, just because that way I can get a little bit more in depth. So in this video, no cutting just the mile high overview of what we're doing. So without further ado, let's get after it. Before we zoom in on the machine, I wanted to go ahead and stand back to give you a good visual of how large the machine is. The main body of the machine is 28 and a half feet long. If you add the control station, you're about 31 feet long, and I'm seven and a half feet away from the wall. I'm five foot, 10 inches tall, so machine is a little bit lower than six feet high. The XR12, same length, Going to need a little bit more distance from the wall, probably about two feet, and it's probably going to be about a foot and a half tall or minimum at the machine. So it's a truly a large machine, just to throw that out there to you. Okay, what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've placed an array of items that we have cut on our rotary cutters using our software to give you some idea of the capabilities that I mentioned earlier right there. So let's go ahead and um, get a little bit closer. Let me show you how the XR6 and the XR12 handle square tubing. There's two ways of doing it. One of them is with the optional square stabilizer, and that's what you see right here. This particular square stabilizer can handle up to four by four inch square tubing. We are working on one that's a little bit larger to stabilize six by six. However, once you get to those large sizes, typically you're gonna use our other solution, which is called ring adapters. I'll show you that in a second. But this is a square system right here. It's extremely robust and it can be removed out of the machine very easily. It has preset stops in it so that it can come in and out of the machine very quickly, referred to as a square stabilizer. All right, the other way of doing it is using what we call ring adapters. And these are a couple of the adapters that we build here. This is a four inch ring adapter. Now it has adapter plates on it that you can see to allow you to go to smaller sizes. For instance, this particular ring adapter can handle a range of inch and a half up to four inches square tubing or anything that can be grabbed as a square. So for instance, a two by three rectangle, two by four, four inch channel, four inch I-beam, things like that. This is a, just a larger version. It's a six inch without the adapters. They all work fine in the XR6. Now, these ring adapters roll on what we call the, whole, the heavy duty roller bracket. It comes free with the machine. It bolts onto the tooling rails and your ring adapter, will then roll onto these right here, and you could place these wherever you want also. So that's the ring adapters. Anyway, to give you an example of some square pieces we cut, this is one right here. Um, pretty, you know, pretty, pretty simple part. I designed it in my CAD program. I use Autodesk Inventor. I'm also a huge fan of Fusion 360, but if you got Creo, SolidWorks, something like that, doesn't matter. I created the part and then I exported it as a step file into our software, which is called Camelot, and voila, there I go. And I'm here to tell you, thank God for the coolant running through this tubing, because um, we cut a couple of them without the coolant, and we threw them away. The slag removal was just, it was just no good. And as soon as we turned on the through the coolant, sure, there was some slag there, but it was remarkably reduced and very easy to clean up. So that's another advantage of it right there. But that's a part that we cut. Now this one here has got 
very fine detail. Some of these around this two right here, that part is only 30 thousandths of an inch thick. That little joint right there handled it no problem. And the reason for that is, is because of the extreme resolution of the XR6 or all the new extreme machines in general. And I'll be talking about that when I get to the control system. Now, another thing we do, oh, by the way, before I go on, the, the advantage of a ring adapter is let's just say you're going to handle a very very long piece of pipe or a square tube or whatever 20 foot long we built a machine years back called we call it a pinocchio machine it's the ones where the tube feeds out the front of the machine uh, we never sold one because it we just hated it so bad the machine was great did what it want but operating it was absolute nightmare so we never we never in good conscience could sell one anyway this machine doesn't have those drawbacks because using ring adapters we can load up a 20 foot piece of whatever we're cutting we don't have to worry about it really sagging and let's just say you've got a um a piece that's got a bend in it that sucker's not straight it's warped right well if you chuck on the chuck Sometimes you get a little excessive wobble. So it turns out that a good way around that is to run two ring adapters and then drive it with a drive shaft that drives the tubing. So that way it can oscillate without a really large, a, a big problem. Um, that's also how we're gonna handle pipe that isn't uniformly round or is warped. You also wanna drive it with a drive shaft. You don't wanna drive it directly. Now I haven't said that, 99% of the parts we cut here, we drive directly with the chuck and don't have really too many issues. All right, let's go ahead and look at another feature of our, mostly it's really our software, Camelot, um, and it's called wedge cutting. So if you look at the legs right here, this is an example of one that would have been cut and then we weld it up. And what a wedge cut is, is you basically cut a wedge out of your square and then you bend it down and you end up with this and then you weld up the three sides so you got that nice outside but more importantly you end up with a much much stronger part than if you had mitered it and then welded it all the way around because all the way around the outside bends and straight you've never cut so it's an extremely strong part but more importantly or also as important it's relatively attractive so if you're in the business of let's just say you're building gym equipment or something like that this could make your machine or uh, your picnic tables or whatever you're building, better looking, and this machine would give you that capability. Remember, whenever you buy a new piece of equipment, you want to increase your capabilities at your business, and that's why we have spent so much time on the XR6 trying to make this platform so versatile that uh, your imagination could run wild. Now, our software will handle this. So you, we just, this part is completely designed in Camelot. It was not done in Inventor. You can't use those software to do that because that software can't unfold the part, whereas our software can, and you can create it. Now, on the subject of software, since I've mentioned it, let me go ahead and tell you real quick about how we feel about software here at JD Squared. Um, that we will never charge you a, a maintenance fee or an upgrade. I know a lot of companies out there love to do that because bottom line is, you know, you, you want to make as much money as you possibly can. However, in the sake of fairness, is it fair that the first guy who got the machine has to pay extra for software that the guy who bought a machine five years down the road, he gets it for free, but you had to pay upgrades? No, we want to continuously uh, develop our software, make it better and better and better, and then you will get that for free, and in return, we hope that you'll tell other people how great the machine is, and that, that's our plan right there. So don't ever worry about being nickel and dime. Once you buy the machine, you're good to go from that point on. All right, let's go ahead and move over to the round pipe. Let's talk about round pipe, tubing, things like that, PVC or whatever. This is an example here of a cut. Um, very simple, it's got a very small hole. A uh, customer came in, wanted to see it cut very small hole. He was very happy. However, we are in the midst of finishing up developing the drill head attachment. So instead of trying to cut these small holes, um, we will be drilling them here in the very near future. Keep that in mind. But anyway, this is a very simple round part. It is processed in the stabilizer, the round tube stabilizer. Let me show you that. <clears throat> That's this one right here. Now I've taken off the back cover of it so that you could see the mechanism a little bit and it has transfer balls inside it and it's fully automatic. So you're gonna hook these hoses up 
that's what these regulators right here are for is to determine how much pressure because if you're working with aluminum or something like that, you don't want too much pressure, you don't want to mar the tube. So this whole mechanism is designed to engage while you're cutting, but when you're not cutting, it'll disengage. That'll allow you to run the machine full speed up or down without dragging those transfer balls right here and wearing them out. Their life is extended hundreds of times over just because of that feature. And once again, it's fully automatic. The machine does have switches right here, which are your override switches to where you could disengage and engage it on your own. Now, this also is an option for the machine. However, I failed to mention earlier, when you buy the machine, you get one of these two options free with the machine, your choice, whether you're doing square or round. The reason we do it that way is obviously it costs money to make these attachments, and we sold machines to people that they're only doing round. That's all they're doing. We've also sold machines to people that are only doing square. So basically we can reduce the overall price of the machine by not adding attachments that people don't want. However, we do realize you're gonna need one of them generally, so you get one free with the machine. Now, I already showed you the heavy duty roller um, bracket that rides, you know, that is used to ride the rings and also the big heavy stuff. So if I was cutting eight inch pipe in this thing, I would be using this roller right here. Now, our software basically also handles things we call cutouts. And this is just a piece that was cut out of a piece of tube so that, for instance, it's got our JD2 logo on it. You've seen them. People put these things on like um, roll bars, things like that to identify their company. You can cut this out in our software, put it on your tubing, tack weld it in place, and away you go. Our software handles that also. Let's come over here. All righty. Another thing our software will handle, round anyway, um, this is a non-uniform piece right here. You can see it funneled down. Our software will handle this natively. We are currently working on tapered work pieces. Um, for instance, let's say you got a flagpole and it's, uh, I don't know, let's just say it's a 40 foot flagpole and you want to drill holes in it for brackets or whatever, you want to process it. In the near future, hopefully before the end of the year, our software um, version two of Camelot will handle tapered work pieces. That's why we like the traveling head so much because we could easily put adapters, and I'll show them to you in a second, to handle different tapers, whereas with a Pinocchio machine we could, we could never do that. Now, this particular part was plasma cut. Pretty decent quality. You can kind of see inside, relatively easy to clean up, not too bad, right? Um, however, I did mention earlier that we can mill the aluminum. And um, this is an example here. The, we, we made this little flange here on our CNC's over there, and then we came over and we used the rotary cutters to cut out the aluminum part, but we used the spindle to cut it out, not the plasma. Um, and we come up with a really, really good um, finish. Hopefully it's zooming in or focusing in okay. Um, it's really, really good. And then they just tack welded it, tigged it a couple places. Now the advantage of milling aluminum over plasma cutting is generally you are going to TIG weld the aluminum. Now when you plasma cut aluminum, you, you don't really get that good of a surface finish. It's okay, but it's nothing to write home about. But when you mill it, you're TIG weld ready. You just wipe that thing off with um, some kind of solvent and then just start welding. So that's a huge, huge advantage of the machine right there. Um, we also supply the machine comes with the machine free, multiple tube adapters. So this one here, for instance, is, um, you can see it's got a three on it. It's rated to go to three inch OD tube. So you'll be getting one, I believe it's inch and a half, three, four, five and a half, and seven inch capacity. And it's these roller systems right here. Now these holes out here allow us to put another attachment on it that basically locks the tubing to the roller down the length of the machine if you have a piece, let's just say it's a very slender piece or whatever, or not slender, but let's say two inch diameter, 50 millimeters, something like that, and it's a little warped. You may want to lock it down. That's what those holes out there. Now, what these brackets do is they fit on what we call the tool rails, or the tooling rails, and that's this part right here. 
The entire frame of our extreme machines has been CNC machined at a giant mill over there. So everything's extremely true, and we put these rails on it. Um, this has been cut so that there's only a few thousands plate, so that when you place these onto the tool rail, it fits with almost no movement at all. Now, there's a hole here. You could bolt it to the rail, or you could also very simply vice grip it to the rail if, for instance, where you need to place the roller, there isn't a hole. You know, it's a little more convenience or whatever. So that's the tooling, and you'll get a series of those free. This is a part that we did for a customer. And, uh, well, not a customer yet. He, he wants to get the machine. Um, he's got a competitor's machine, and I believe he told me he, um, he fought for about two days to make this part with their software and their machine. And um, we did it in about 30, 40 minutes. It's on YouTube. I did it on the previous generation rotary cutter, the RC6. But as you can see, extreme good fit up and everything like that. It was easy peasy. It was no problem whatsoever. Um, it blew his mind. So anyway, that is how we're going to be handling the red, I mean the round two, but I just noticed I left my red solo cup. Um, truly I'm an American. There's my red solo cup. Um, but anyway, that's all we got to talk about round. Let's, let's move our attention over to things that are not round and are not square. Let's turn our attention now to structural steel such as this piece of, uh, this is a piece of six inch channel right here. Now this adapter is an option that we sell. Uh, we sell quite a bit of different tooling for this machine so you um, get a lot of versatility out of it. This particular one is designed to handle up to eight inch channel with three inch flanges in that neighborhood. It could probably handle a little bit larger flange than that, but eight inch on the main, the main body there. Um, and it bolts in like that, and these blocks are repositionable so that you could change to different sizes, such as you know two inch channel, three inch, uh, four inch channel, stuff like that. And then it bolts into the machine. It's got uh, the machined ends so that it'll lock into the vise very securely, and that's how you would rotate it. Now, on the other end of your structural steel, you're gonna run one of those ring adapters that I showed you in order to stabilize it, and that ring adapter is gonna run on the rollers right here. We also sell another piece of tooling called the universal jig plate. Now, this one doesn't have all the little blocks on it, but it does come with them. I think it comes with like eight or 10 blocks. And this allows you to bolt just weird shaped stuff. So let's just say you're going to, um, do a octagon or a channel, uh, you know, something like that, something weird. You can position these blocks around and lock it in to the jig plate because it may not fit that good on your chuck. It may not work. So that's what the universal jig plate does. Now, this plate here will also grab, you know, it'll grab square uh, tubing, channel, I-beam, things like that. Um, with it, but this is just another example of a piece of tooling that we sell to help you get the job done. That pretty much covers the round. When we handle the, I mean the structural, when we do structural, we will design it in another program such as Inventor, SolidWorks, Fusion, something like that, export it as a step file, then Camelot will take over and will process the cutting of the structural steel. Now, we don't have it 100% done, where we are struggling a little bit, not really struggling, we just haven't had the, the time to put the resources in, is um, I-beam, stuff like that. Because when you get a piece of I-beam, let's just say this is your flange here, this is the, the middle part, the web or whatever. Um, if you're coming across with your torch this way, you're gonna come up short because you're gonna hit the inside of the flange. So basically what you gotta do is you gotta roll. So in order to handle I-beam, you cut the outside beams first, then you come along and you cut out the inside. Um, and then you, when you cut the inside, you're gonna roll a little bit, but you can't roll that far because the other flange will hit. So you could see where generating G-code to do that is not a trivial, a trivial matter. Um, but we will accomplish it here, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but right now it is on our list of things to do. Um, but there are other ways around it. We, we could easily cut it. What we do is we cut the flanges and then that leaves that tab in the inside right here. And then we just come back and we cut it out by hand, no problem. We get the job done. It's just not 100% done on the XR6 yet, but it is coming. All right, let's go ahead and look at 
flat material. Let's just say you want to cut a bracket up, like little brackets or something like that. I don't know. Remember, you've got about 16 inches of capacity this way, in and out on the x-axis, and the length of the machine. So you can load up a piece of, of material, uh, let's just say a piece of 12-inch channel, lay it flat in the machine, do all your processing. For instance, let's say you're making stairs, you know, or stair steps or something like that. Do all your processing and take it out. Now, um, the way we do that, since we're not rotating it, we use another attachment that we give you a couple of these with the machine also. And basically, it's got an adjustable back edge here, and then it's got an extension here where you could extend it out. And you would place it on the tooling rails, and then you would place your part on it, bump it up against the backstop, and just start machining your parts or cutting your parts. So if you've got a lot of these to make with the backstop, you just bump it up, just keep on going. It really, really makes the job easy. So that's how you would handle material that you're going to lay flat. Now, just to show you something else the machine is capable of, um, this is wood routing right here. Um, little little baby, one of our employees took a picture of his baby and um, routed his face on there. And he also got himself a Shelby GT350. Guess who runs the machines? Yeah, that guy. Anyway, um, you could do that in the machine, but where we're really excited about is column machining to where, let's just say you're doing really exotic work and you want to just basically carve out this exotic column or any kind of column, bed post, whatever, this is the machine that will do it. Now, I'm getting ready to do one in a couple weeks, and, and um, it's, um, it's two women that are unclothed on a pole, not that kind of pole. This is a statue from like Greece or, or Athens or something like that. And I'm very excited about doing that because um, it's just a cool looking piece. And you know, it's, come on, let's face it, sometimes you just want to have fun, you want to do some cool stuff. But this machine could handle it easy peasy because it's one heck of a wood router. And um, all we got to do is take the torch out, put the high speed spindle in, and off we go. So be looking for that video. Um, Maybe I might be able to get to it um, within the next few weeks. That'd be awesome. Um, I am getting ready to start doing a lot of videos on the XR6 over the next week or so, probably five or six of them, just showing the machine cutting things like square, you know, the column, hopefully, and stuff like that. So um, subscribe, hit the notice bell if you want to if you want to get notified when I pop them up. But I am getting ready to go into high gear and start making all these videos. Anyway, that's about it. Just showing you some of the sample pieces that we can cut. Let's go ahead and start talking now about the machine itself. I'd like to start at the middle of the machine just because it's the simplest thing to talk about. We've got three sections. We've got your main section, the midsection, and then the extension. They're all 100% steel weldments. There is no brackets on it, so leakage shouldn't be a problem. Also, they are angled downward toward the center for this reservoir right here for very efficient coolant recovery so that we can recover that coolant, process it through the tube very quickly. So, um, in fact, inside the bed, you can't see in the video, the sides are actually angled inward also. Once again, trying to get that every little bit of coolant as quickly as we can back into the tank. So that's all done. Now, I did show you the tooling rails earlier. On an XR6, there's a single tooling rail because that's all we need. However, on the XR12, we run two tooling rails to accommodate the extra weight, plus the frame is, uh, is much, much larger. But it has two rails, same principle, One's just a little beefier than the other to handle truly massive stuff. All righty. Um, uh, we run round rails. We run roller bearings on concave rollers, and we run them on a round rail out here. We do that because we're plasma cutting. Plasma cutting does not like linear guides, or uh, basically linear guides doesn't like plasma cutting. The dust tears the seals up, wears them out, then you got to disassemble the machine and fix it. So we don't generally like exposed linear guides. Having said that, the entire gantry is linear guides, but I'll show you how we enclose them to keep the dust off them or at least minimize it. So this is the main frame right here. If you notice, we have very easily adjustable legs on the bottom, those swivel feet, and we bolt the machine to the ground. 
The motors in this machine are so powerful that if we were just to sit there and spin, say for instance that eight inch pipe I showed you earlier, this machine will move. It'll walk its way out of the building. So keep in mind that you are going to have to bolt it to the ground. I did an entire video showing you how to install the machine. Check that out if you're curious. But anyway, that's another feature, makes it easy. Now, underneath the midsection is the reservoir tank. All XR rotaries come with this standard equipment. There is no upcharge, it's free, because we have learned that uh, coolant running through your part where you're cutting is, in our opinion, an absolute necessity. There's, there's no point not doing it. So we just said, heck, make it a standard feature. So that's where it's at. And then it's got the drain pipes you can see right here that will drain the three sections into it. Then it runs it back through another tube to the other end for, um, to, to recycle the tubing. So you'll be getting that for free. Another thing that you could see over here is the lifter right here, the lifter system. I'll walk down in a minute, I'll actuate, I'll act, activate it or actuate it, one of the two. Um, so you can see it actually move. Right now it's in the up position, but it'll go down when, it, when the carriage, I'm sorry, the gantry gets near it, it will automatically depress and get out of the way. The machines come with one of these free of charge. We've never used more than two, um, um, but we, we have used one a lot. So the bottom line is though, we can put an unlimited number of attachments in this machine. So if I wanted to put four lifters in it, it would not be a problem because our new control system is virtually unlimited number of input outputs and what we can control with it. And I'll be talking about that in a, in a minute. It's super, um, we're super excited about the new control system. But anyway, that's a lifter. Let me walk down, I'll hit the go button and you can see it move. Alrighty, I'm just coming down here to the control station and down and up. Let's go. There you go. All right, that shows you how to the lifter. Now another feature of the lifter is we have made it so that we could change out these plates right here. And by changing out the plates, we can customize it for different sizes and shapes of material. So right now, this particular one here, I think we were doing um, two inch square. No, I take the back. We were doing one and a half by three, and it was for that truss video that I did months and months and months back. This was the lifter that did it. Now, let's just say I was gonna handle um, four inch square, or let's just say four by six inch rectangular, right? Then what I wanna do is I'm going to get another plate that was designed to handle that. And what we're looking to do is corner to corner. We want something so that as we roll, the corners kind of go through that concave surface. So we could do that. Now, the beauty of this machine is, let's just say you want to bang out your own plate, then just load up a piece of flat stock and cut it out yourself. You can make whatever you want, but we do supply them also if you need them. That's another feature. The entire, um, Lifter system is made out of stainless steel, and I spent a lot of time um, thinking about this, thinking about what happens if somebody screws up and the gantry runs into this bad boy and, and wrecks it, right? So what I've done, I've got it designed to where it's stainless steel, it's made out of, um, looks like 3 16 inch stainless steel. It's pretty robust, but it will give up before it damages anything there. It'll basically fold itself down. So if you do wipe one out, Give us a call. We'll probably give you the parts for free to fix it. They're not that bad. Um, if you do it a couple times, though, it's on you after that. But um, we've never crashed one here, ever. Uh, well, unintentionally, we never, we've crashed them on purpose. We haven't crashed them unintentionally. Um, so it's pretty hard to crash it unless you put the lifter in the machine and forget to tell the machine where the lifter's at. Yeah, then you could crash it for sure. All right, anyway, that's pretty much the lifter. Um, only other thing I tell you about the lifter is we have the air hose are coming up and they actually run through guards underneath in the tray right there to prevent any heavy pieces of metal of falling on it and actually damaging the pneumatic hoses. So that's another feature right there. All right, that pretty much sums up this. I will show you a little bit more in the production area. Let's go on down to the power head and the control station side. I'm at the business end of the machine, and this is what we refer to as the control station. 
we supply the machine with this computer here. Now, I'm going to tell you something we've done here recently. We've got a lot of CNC's, 40-something CNC's here. And um, we've had to replace monitors and computers in these CNC's, and they're not cheap. We had one go out here not too long ago, and it was $6,000 to replace the monitor in the video subsystem. I'm here to tell you, that's the second time we've done it. Now, that gets old pretty darn quick. So we used to use Nooks. They were an industrial computer. Nook is NUC, -N made by Intel. And they worked pretty good. But what we found out was their life was no greater than these personal computers that we could pick up from Best Buy or Amazon. And the reason for that is a lot of industrial computers don't have fans. They're, you know, to prevent the dust and everything. And we thought that was a big deal. So they run very, very hot. These, on the other hand, like I said, this one's about 700 bucks, and I'm looking at it from the point of view that if this thing dies in three, four, five years, I'll just go out and buy another one from Best Buy, pop it on there, and away I go. So we have gone to um, personal computers. We do not feel that we have cheapened the machine. We think we've just made it better and a little cheaper to maintain the machine in the future. We have, I think we've had one of these die on us, um, but man, we do a lot of these things, a lot of them. So um, this is what we kind of we kind of use on all of our machinery now, just because it's so darn convenient. It also has Wi-Fi, internet, and all in it, and that's very important because the XR machines have about. I think it's four computers in the machine itself, not counting this one. Um, and they have to be updated. And we're constantly improving the machine. Our goal every year is to make sure that if you have our machine, by the end of the year, your machine is better than it was at the beginning of the year. So that is accomplished through software. So that software is free. However, the computer has to be able to get onto the internet in order to download that software. So if you call for support, the first thing you're going to ask is what version of software you're on. You need to be on the very latest version because if you have an issue or something you don't understand or a suggestion, we may have already implemented it in our software um, and your call was unnecessary. So you, every once in a while, you want the machine to go online. It doesn't have to be online to operate, but if you want it to, to update itself, it's got to be online. The other thing we like about these computers a lot is they come with a wireless um, keyboard. I'm moving in here. So here comes the chuck. There's the chuck right there. I mean, the gantry's moving on down. I can walk around and control the entire machine, and I don't have to have one of those um, the little pendants, you know? Um, this here, I can easily accomplish the same thing. So we really like that. You've got your e-stop right here to shut the machine down. comes on a pretty little pedestal. The back is open where all the wiring can go in and be tie-wrapped in. All right, let's go ahead and... Um, talk about the power head right here. The XR6 has a 6-inch, 4-jaw synchronous chuck. The XR12 comes with a much larger 10-inch chuck. We don't want to use a huge chuck in these because chucks act like flywheels. So when you're trying to spin the chuck, you're taking away, uh, or that inertia of the chuck is being subtracted from the inertia of the part that you can cut, therefore you cut a smaller part. So we run a six inch chuck, which will easily handle anything up to six inch. If we go bigger than that, we may have to put an adapter like I showed you earlier in it, but it's so peasy. For instance, we cut eight inch pipe with this six inch chuck. We just grab the outside of the jaws. It, we grab it by the ID of the, of the pipe. It works really, really good. You can see the tube coming in the back right here. That's for the coolant injection. Now, I'm going to take you over in the production area here in a little while and show you the guts of the power head. It's, um, it's, um, it's pretty cool. It's got big bearings, big spindle, everything like that. But let me tell you a couple of features on our power head that is unique to the JD squared. One, remember I was telling you we have all the tooling that when you place it in the machine, you just come up and pop your tube or pipe into your bearings or your stabilizer, whatever you want to do, right? Well, when you do that, on a lot of other machines, people, competitors' machines, you have to adjust all of these rollers all the way down your machine individually to level the tube. You don't have to do that with a JD squared machine. You pop in your, your, your little things, you can literally put them in, in under a minute, and then you just load your tube up. Your tube is ready to cut. However, you now need to move the chuck to the tube. So instead of adjusting all of these rollers, 
we got it down to one adjustment. And there's a 20 millimeter um, threader rod back there. By the way, all machinery we built here, JD squared, uh, except for our two benders here, um, are metric. I like the metric system. I'm not a big fan of the imperial system. By the way, for you all in other countries, not in America, America is mostly metric. Uh, I know I see a lot of comments, oh, America, you know, imperial system is just so far behind. Well, you know, the stuff we build here in America, F-22, SpaceX, everything like that, it's all metric. This machine is all metric too because we built a world machine. I did not build a machine for the American market. This is designed to go anywhere in the world. The electronics is designed to work anywhere in the world. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. So if you are going to work on the machine, get yourself some metric tools if you happen to be here in America. Now, another feature of the power head, other than just going up and down, is the um, ability to move in and out, slide down its rails. It's got a little over four inches of travel. Now, the reason I did that was, let's say we're going to cut that eight inch pipe that I showed you earlier, and we've got you know, a big section in it, you know, or something like that, I don't know, 14 foot section, whatever. Um, that is a really hard thing to slide by hand because the rollers are actually orientated down the machine. They're not positioned to allow you to slide anything easily this way. They just let you roll easy. So what happens is when we load up the parts into the XR6, we drive the gantry to the other end of the machine. You can see how fast it moves. It's pretty quick, over a thousand inches a minute. Um, and then we load the tube, we load the pipe up, and then we bring the chuck by sliding it this way to the pipe. Super, super simple. I mean, you're done in less than a minute. So I could change out my all of my plates for my part. Let's just say I was cutting inch and a half tube, now I want to cut that eight inch pipe. I could change everything out in about three minutes. Uh, I'd, I'd be willing to bet you money I could do it, definitely for sure, under four minutes. Just remove the parts, pop out the stabilizer, adjust this up, and away we go. So we're trying to minimize the hassle of just changing between work pieces and we've accomplished that with this system right here. Alrighty, let's go ahead. Oh, well before I leave, you could probably see the gear racks right here. They're down facing and there's one on each side. The gantry is driven both sides synchronously and that means we don't ever have to worry about the gantry being out of alignment where you're cutting crooked and that's another reason now the reason they're down facing is a couple reasons one a um, little bit safer you're not going to rub your legs against it or something like that but also you don't attempt you don't accumulate debris in the teeth of the gear rack so if we are routing wood which it's going to put wood everywhere there's going to be wood everywhere even with a vacuum on there we're still going to have a lot of wood because we're cutting a round piece and it's kind of difficult to seal that up if you do a square column it's really difficult because if you roll around the corner all of your brushes are now going to be um, off the workpiece and the dust is going to be able to get out. So that's another reason why they're down facing. Alrighty, I can't think of anything else to say right here. Let's go to the really cool part of the machine, the gantry. Here we go. This is the gantry of the XR6. The XR12 is extremely similar. It, once again, it's just bigger, got bigger travel, stuff like that, a little bit more robust that maybe possibly handle a, a larger drill head. But let's go ahead and talk about some of the features. Uh, and I'm going to be showing them to you down there. I'll show you the inside down there, the linear guides, the dust um, uh, system that we have, trying to keep the dust out of the machine, stuff like that. I'll show that to you down there because there's machines being built down there that don't have covers on it. But here, let's just go over the main features. Let's start right here. All of our machines come with a dual marker system, a scriber, a pneumatic scriber, so that you can permanently scribe into your metal or whatever. Uh, let's just say you're going to put outlines or where you want to put a bracket or you want to engrave a part number in it, which our software will do, you would use the scriber. However, if you want a temporary mark that you don't want permanently in your material, we also have a marker. It's basically a Sharpie, magic marker, push button Sharpie. And you could use either one of those in order to mark your tubing. Camelot, our software, has all kinds of features in it, such as marking the OD of one tube where it meets another so that you don't have to use tabbing. You could bump it up there, line it up with the marks, and weld it in. Tabs are on our list because every once in a while we get a call, about two, three a year. 
Are we going to do tabbing? I am not a fan of tabbing. Tabbing is where you actually have a tap and you a tab on one part, you cut a little hole in the other one, the tap fits in, right? Sounds like a good idea until you realize unless you have perfectly bent structures and structures that you could actually get the tab into, it's a nightmare. So what we do here is we mark the tube where we want the joint to be and we just line it up, tack it, and we haven't cut that hole in our other pipe which basically is a stress concentration point. That's one of the reasons we don't like tabbing. Having said that, eventually we'll get around to it. It's going to be next year. It's going to be in version 2 Camelot. Uh, it's, it's not a very high priority. I'm just going to tell you straight up. It's not a high priority for us right now. Tilt head and some other stuff, ultra high priority. So anyway, that's the marker system comes standard on the machine. Another thing that comes standard on the machine is the magnetic breakaway the head. So that if it does contact your workpiece or something, then it's going to basically dislocate the machine will know it's dislocated and it will stop the machine from moving. That way, if the torch falls out of the machine, you don't got this live torch blasting away, you know, in your table or God knows where it's at. It'll automatically turn itself off. Another feature in the machine is a floating head. You can see me moving the torch up or down right here. This is our second, our second generation floating head, and I don't know if it gets any better than this. this. This worked out really, really good. Now, the reason we put a floating head in the machine is you can see the copper nozzle right here. And the way plasmas work is um, they're going to go, you're going to drive your torch down, it's going to touch your workpiece, and it's going to complete the circuit. That's why you have a wire right here that is running back to the plasma unit. And it's going to say, oh, that's where my metal is. It's going to raise up the pierce height, pierce start cutting, right? Now, supposing your pipe has been painted, powder coated, or is extremely rusty. By the way, rust doesn't conduct electricity very well. So it's a real, real problem, right? The way we got around that years and years and years ago was we developed a floating head that when the head hits the material, it, it'll float up. If there's no electrical connection, it'll float up. There's a switch inside that will trigger. Now our machine says, oh, that's where the material is. I didn't get an electrical connection, but the floating head triggered. That's where I'm going to start cutting. And it works great. Now, um, that is also standard. Standard on the machines is also the laser pointer. Now, this helps if you want to flip the tube around. So let's just say you've got a, a 30 foot piece of pipe you want to cut, right? But you don't want to buy another extension. You don't want to make the machine longer. You want to stay with your, your standard XR6. In our software, we have provisions where you it could mark, using a marker, most likely the Sharpie, a crosshair. Now you break the program up, Camelot will do this, into two programs. One will be one half of your tube, then you're going to take it out, flip your tube around, rotate it, line the laser pointer up on the crosshair, say, okay, this is my origin right here. Now you could run the second program and cut the rest of the pipe. So you could easily process pipe that is twice as long as the machine, providing we have enough power in the power head to overcome the inertia of whatever you're cutting. So they come with a laser pointer. Now, what you're going to see inside this here, and I'm going to show it to you over there in the production area, it's much easier to see. We have twin linear guides here because this is what we we refer to as the new extreme carriage and it is common on our rotary cutters and our flatbeds it's extremely versatile i will um show you a picture of the high speed spindle mounted on this head but it's on a flat machine it's not on this round one now the reason we did that we wanted some kind of common ground so that if i develop something for the flatbed it'll still work on here. For instance, automatic tool changer. Let's just say we got the router in it, we want to go to tool change type solutions automatic. This will allow us to develop one for the one machine but still be able to use it on the other. Now, the back plate back here, you'll see it better over there, has been drilled and tapped and it's helicoiled with steel helicoils because we, we want this machine to be around for decades so we're not a big enthusiast of running threads into a, a, um, aluminum tapped holes. So we helicoil all the holes there. And all of this tooling can be removed off the machine. Um, and then we could put on a high speed spindle or whatever we want to do. Kind of like when you buy 
uh, you know, a Haas CNC or something, you start buying vices and rotary fixtures, and you, you set the machine up for whatever job you want to do. That's the way um, our extreme series of machines are set up to do. Now, I'm going to see if I can get out of the way here. Um, yeah, let me move this over a little bit. All righty. Let's see. Yeah, right here. Okay, this is the drill head that we're currently working on. Now, I'm estimating, I think the day's August 9th or 10th, I'm losing track of time. Um, the drill head right here is still a work in progress. We have all of the mechanics are in the machine, including the extra travel head right here with the pneumatic cylinder. Um, and what that does, by the way, is when you cut, if, if you're going to drill holes it and cut something out, you, or cut something out, you definitely want to drill the holes first, right? So what would happen is this air cylinder will actuate, that will lift the torch up, you drill your hole, then the torch is lowered back down, and you then cut out your piece. So that's how that works. Now, what we're still working on right here is the software end of the deal. So this is an option for the machine. Should be out, um, if I had to guess, I'd say by the end of September 2022, um, we're working on it pretty good, but right now we're really concentrating hard on production. Having said that, everybody and his brother wants this drill head right here. Now this drill head is a common Milwaukee mag drill head. You can buy them from Granger, Zorro, stuff like that. This one's got a half inch chuck and it's able to handle 200 pounds of thrust down. Um, we are not trying to build a machine that's gonna drill a one inch hole. It's not gonna happen. Um, we're not sure exactly what it's going to drill. We know half inch holes should be no problem at all, but when you get the bigger holes, we're, we're really striving to get a 13, 16 inch hole. Now, may have to be pilot drilled, who knows, but we'll know here in just a matter of weeks or whatever. Now, part of this option is not only the extended travel of the floating head, because the standard floating head only moves 200 thousandths of an inch or five millimeters. This one here, however, moves around 50 millimeters, about two inches of travel, so that we could drill holes, which means if we're drilling holes and we're cutting, you're gonna be limited to about a one inch, one and a quarter inch depth of drill, you know? We're not trying to make a drill that's gonna drill, you know, five, six inches into a piece of metal, it's just not gonna happen. So um, this is really designed to drill holes in like pipe, tubing, uh, channel, things like that. Now, here's what's gonna happen. We've got the whole gantry right here, and you start drilling here near the front of it, you're gonna put out 200 pounds of force. The odds are you're gonna to try to lift the gantry. Even though it's really heavy, a lot of the weight is behind the drill on the rear roller. So she'll try to wheelie, right? So if you look right here, you see the red, the red plate? There's one on each side. Inside that plate is dual rod pneumatic actuators. So when we get ready to drill, we get into position, these things here will actuate, boom, pop up, lock the gantry to the frame. Now we can drill without having to worry about lifting the, um, lifting the front gantry. Each one of these pneumatic um, deals I believe is good for 86 pounds of force. Um, I'm sorry, I, don't, I do not know what the metric equivalent of that is. Um, well, let's see, kilograms, about 40 kilograms, I guess, you know, in that ballpark. So anyway, that's each side. So that gives us another 160 pounds, you know, 70 something kilograms of force to keep that bad boy locked out. So look here in the future, uh, one of my future videos, you'll see us drilling it or drilling holes because it is one of, right now it's our highest priority project is to drill those holes. Now, let me give you a quick roadmap of where we're heading with the machine. We've already got high speed spindles on it, mag drills, all this stuff. We're heading to a full six axis machine. In other words, we want the torch to be able to rotate not only this way, but also this way. Now, inside the control box that is mounted on the gantry, this is where your amplifiers and the electronics are contained to drive the your scowl motors. Um, and I'll talk about the motors when I go down there. 
there's extra space in here to allow us to run more motors which is the tilt head motors. So we'll be putting that on there. And then once again, we're also gonna be doing other attachments. For some reason, I got it in my head, I wanna make a, a pen that it will change out pins, like markers and everything, different colors. Uh, should be a fairly simple thing to do. And what I'm looking to do is I'm thinking more of the art community. Some of you may wanna draw something really fancy, really long and all, and I know that's not a big market, but hey, come on, it's fun. So um, that is some of the stuff we're gonna work on. There's also other attachments that we're gonna be bringing out. For instance, a um, we wanna look at the possibility of welding on these machines and our flatbeds. So we wanna be able to put a MIG welder on it and weld. So for instance, let's just say we're going to weld brackets onto this thing, this square tubing right here. How cool would it be to be able to use the metal scriber, come along, scribe where your brackets are going to be, come over, weld the brackets in the machine. Our machine is electrically hardened, so you can weld on the machine and not take the electronics out. It's really well designed. So you go ahead, you position everything, you weld it up uh, or you tack it into place and then have the machine come along and auto weld it. So that's something that I wanna be working on next year. And that doesn't really have anything to do with rotary cutter. That's really more for people who are making buildings like I'm in that are making spars and they wanna weld the flanges down and they don't wanna go out and buy dedicated robots and stuff like that. So that's another feature that I'm gonna be working on next year. Um, maybe even hopefully before the end of this year, that would, that would be really, really nice. But the tilt head is very, very important for us. So it's probably gonna come first. Now, since I'm talking about tilt head, I'm gonna tell you there's gonna be several different versions of it. One of the versions is gonna be extremely inexpensive and it's manual. You basically manually move it. So let's just say you want to get your pipe on the end and you wanna bevel that pipe, we could pop an M0, which is the G code, uh, command telling the machine to pause and we just manually kick it over, lock it into position. Now we can bevel the end of our pipe. That's the cheapest solution to do. Um, very, very cheap. Now the next sex, the next solution is a tilt head that only moves this way here. You know, and that means we're only using one motor. That'll allow us to bevel our pipe, things like that. That's another controller, a little bit cheaper, or a little bit more expensive. Now, the most expensive one would be the one that does it all, because now you basically got a six axis machine, and I'm telling you, it's, it's not gonna be cheap. You know, it's not gonna be as expensive as what you're used to seeing out there, but it, you know, it's not cheap because there's a tremendous amount of software that goes into it, all the servo motors and everything. There's, there, it's a ton of work to cut on six axes. Five, not so bad. Six, oh boy. So anyway, that is all coming. So the bottom line, the takeaway here is that we don't know where this machine is going. We have so many ideas run through our head. Customers that already have our machines are feeding us ideas. So we think we've got most of them covered. But anyway, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, I gotta hit the start here, okay? The, you can see how fast she moves. Now that, by the way, is a ball screw in there. Um, you got 16 inches of travel this way, and I believe it's seven inches of travel up or down. So it's got a lot of travel. The XR12 is 12 inches. It's either, oh gosh, I can't remember, either 10 and a half or 12 inches of travel in that general area. So it's much more travel this way, but it's got 30 inches of X travel. It is a ton of travel. And that is for people that are doing really big stuff. They want to load up a piece of 24 inch channel or I beam. I'm talking 24 inches this way. I don't, you know, not link. And they want to cut their holes and everything. That's what the XR12. So the XR6 from the bottom of the gantry, if you can see my hand right here, to the top of the rails is about 12 inches of room that we have to work with. So we can't make a ring adapter, for instance, larger than that and pass over it with the gantry. It's gotta be smaller than that. The XR12 
I believe is 23 inches, you know, in that area. It's really big, you know, um, because of what it's designed to do. So that's a difference right there. You'll see that in the video here, hopefully about a month or so, you know, three, four or five weeks, whenever we get that XR12 done, we'll show it to you. All right, so anyway, that is the overview of the machine here. I think to describe some of the components a little bit better to you, let's take a walk on down to where they're actually building these machines now, and I can show you the guts inside or underneath the covers. Okay, I'm walking into the production area. In fact, that's actually a rotary attachment that goes on our flatbed tables. Uses the same power head that we have on the XR6. It's just a much shorter version of the machine. Those are the flatheads, I mean the flatbeds over there. Let's walk over here. I see some of the midsections. And what I want to show you here is you can see how they've been machined. This is an XR12 frame right here that hopefully will start assembling some of the stuff on it here real soon. Um, you can see the machine pads that we have right there. All right, let's walk on over and I'll show you some of the features that I was talking about in the machine. And we're gonna go ahead and start right here. Even though this is a flat bed machine, Remember, I said that they use the same head as the XR6s. You'll see that in a minute. So let's take a look here. Right there, if you notice, you can see dual linear guides. I don't know if that's going to mess with the autofocus in the machine. And between the linear guides, there's a 16 millimeter um, high torque trapezoidal screw. That screw is rated for over 2,000 pounds of load. If you remember, I mentioned that the drill head is rated for 200. We have over a 10 to 1 safety factor. That is the front plate of the, of the extreme carriage right there. Now, it'll have the helicoils will be installed. They're not installed yet. I don't see them. Um, but they do have them probably already installed where they've got the marker system. If you notice here, these are the quick disconnects that will allow you to remove from the machine the torch or whatever very quickly if you want to switch it over to a spindle design. If we go to the top up here, you can see where it says Yaskawa motors. Those are some of the best motors in the world. Um, extremely powerful. You wouldn't think that by the size, but look at the size gearbox on there to handle the torque coming out of that motor. Now these are what you call EtherCAT motors. So we talk to the main controller, which let me walk over here. This, these are XR6s that are about completed right here. There's six of them that are about done and, and it looks like they get ready to start putting the seventh one together. This is the amplifiers there that are talking to the motors. Now we talk to them from our computer to, um, through EthoCAT cable, so we could control a motor, like I mentioned earlier, 100 meters away or 330 feet. Now, this is the control box on the back of the gantry. There's another control box on the machine itself. This one basically is containing all the pneumatics, the amplifiers, everything like that, and it runs along with the gantry, and that means the wires are much, much shorter. And unfortunately, in this time of eight, in this time, um, you know, with the logistics problem around the entire world, you know, getting wire is kind of hard too. So this helps minimize it. But it also uh, presents us other opportunities of future expansion. So if you notice, we have two open areas right there. That is for the tilt head amplifiers. So as soon as we get onto that, that's where those will go right there. All right, you can see they've mounted the regulator. While I'm over here at the machine, let me show you the inside of the XR6 gantry. We use a 10 inch by one inch flat plate that has been completely machined as a backbone. And inside it, you can see two linear guides and they are running the transport. And on the transport, we have six rollers that are basically, you know, containing that belt right there. Now, what that belt is doing, oh, before I talk about belt, there's also, if you notice, you can see the, the heavy duty ball screw in there with the seals and all. That's how we drive the X-axis is with a ball screw. Now, on the front of the machine, you can see what those belts are doing. They're kind of sealing up the, the front plate right here. And that's helping prevent uh, plasma dust from getting inside the machine. It won't, it isn't a hundred percent sealed, but you know, it's pretty doggone good, you know, so we don't really have any issue at all with dust. Now, if you look here, let's look, let's look over here. You could see 
on the front of the carriage, just like I showed you on the machine. This is an XR6. You can see the commonality the, uh, between the heads. They're the exact same head right there. Now, if we go over here to the Y carriage, let me point out a couple features with that real quick. On each side, we are running, let me back up just a little bit, we are running dual HTD, that stands for high torque drive belts, and they're running through a drive shaft that you can see right through there. So they synchronize both sides of the machine. They're filament wound, so uh, or sub filament um, supported or whatever. So they're very little stretch or anything like that. We have incredible accuracy with, with that system right there. Now, we run a little different system than everybody else does out there. We developed this about a year and a half ago. And what it is, is if you look at it right here, you could see that we had the belt coming down, and I think my fingers are gonna mess with the autofocus. Let me see if I punch it back a little bit, trying to minimize that. If you can see right there, we have a red die spring. The way our system works is you adjust the belt tension with the provided meter that we give you with the machine to the correct uh, poundage, and I think it's 55 pounds, you know, um, 25, mil uh, 25 kilograms, whatever. Well, once you adjust that, you're pulling the spur gear up, up into the, um, the gear rack. The, we found out that by adding a, a spring out there and then pivoting the whole thing this way, that we could adjust that die spring and take almost all of the load off the spur gear, which means you have an incredibly accurate conformal system that doesn't have excessive pressure between the spur gear and the rack. That has worked out just unbelievably well. You could also see the pocket right there where the pneumatic uh, actuator will be installed. In fact, let me walk over here. Um, I saw one on the XR12 frame. We'll just go ahead and show it to you real quick. There you go. That is what the actuator looks like inside of the machine. And that will raise up and lock itself to the frame. Just wanted to show you that real quick. Now there's one on each side of the machine. So let's walk over here and let's just take a look at the power head. The power head is this right here. Obviously all the covers are off. You can see we've got the six inch chuck right there. We've got the 10 to 1 heavy duty gearbox and the Yaskawa motor. And then we run through a 5.6 to 1 belt reduction. So we're getting a 56 to 1 reduction, which means we have got a ton of torque to turn big heavy pipe. You can also see that this machine has the round tube stabilizer installed. In fact, so does that one. They all do. So I guess everybody decided they want the round tube stabilizer. Anyway, that's in the machine. You can see the transfer balls right there. Um, look for other videos that'll show you actually how that operates in the real world. But if you notice on the, on the power head here too, you could see the bolts and the nuts in the back back here that, oh, I think autofocus, I think I just saw it go out. Okay, there you go. Those bolts right there. If you break them loose, that's what's going to allow you to slide the power head in and out. Um, the ground cable, pretty large ground cable right here for the welder. You can also see the reed switches right, right here and the blade right next to it that will go through the reed switch. Being a non-contact system, the life is extremely good on that. All right, um, let's go ahead and talk about some other features that we put in the machine. One, the cable carrier. Totally enclosed cable carrier made by a German company called Igus. Uh, they make some of the best stuff in the world. That's what we're using. Also, almost all of the wiring in the machine is also made by Igus because they make special wire that is extremely good at keeping electrical noise out of your system. So all of that is Igus wire right there. And we process that and... There, obviously, it's a Sunday afternoon, by the way, so there's really nobody here but me, um, on automatic wire making machinery, and that's why you see all of the labels on the wires, because the automatic machine will automatically put the part numbers there. That allows us to very easily, um, if we have to swap a part out in the field or we have to have you swap it out, um, well, you know where to hook it up. It makes it real simple. Now, this is the control box on the back of the gantry. If you notice, we got three drives. That's going to drive the X, Y, and the Z up, down, down the machine, and um, left and right. 
On the right side, we have open area, and that's the area where we're going to be putting the amplifiers for the tilt head. That'll be coming up fairly soon. Now, this machine doesn't have the covers on the rollers right there, so you can see the concave rollers. That's what's actually rolling up and down the frame, and we've never, ever had a single issue with that whatsoever. So we're really, really happy. All right, let's go ahead, and since we've already managed to work our way over here to the control box on the gantry, let's go ahead and talk about the control box in the machine itself. And you can see it right there, bolts to the, bolts to the side of the frame, now, if we get close, let me get down here, you notice that there's a lot of open area right there. And it's open because we want to be able to put things in like the VFD, the variable frequency drive for the spindles and everything, can now be mounted inside the control box. We don't have to worry about it. Now, what you see here, this here, is the amplifier for the rotary head the power head, and right next to it, the black box, is our motion control computer. Notice it has multiple EtherCAT ports on it. That's so that we can talk to other machines in the future. Think robots, you know, things like that. Um, we're also thinking about um, things like um, autoloaders, like building an autoloading attachment to autoload it. Now, we'll probably start working on that next year after we have the drill done first, tilt head next, then we're going to do, um, what was after that? Um, oh gosh, oh, welder, put the MIG welder on it, stuff like that. Now, above it is the computer system in here that we build. Now, we manufacture that here in-house. It's, it's almost infinitely expandable. And the beauty of our new drive system is we can now control 32 motors nine of them coordinated with each other like a nine axis machine uh we're not gonna do that we're gonna go six axis but we can go 32 motors which means we can make a tremendous number of cool attachments for the machine because we're not no longer computer limited we can also add and subtract input and outputs pretty much at will if we needed you know 200 outputs and inputs it would be no big deal for us to do that because of our new system now these motors these yaskawa motors right here these are the ones that have an absolute ridiculous resolution. So I, I think the resolution of our machine, now I, I'm guessing here, I know it's better than one ten thousandth of an inch, 0 0.0001. Um, I think it's four or five one hundred thousandths of an inch resolution. So we have an extremely accurate machine. But anyway, um, this will give you a little bit better idea of what the machines look like inside. And as I mentioned, we make the control box that has all the, all the wires, pretty cool wires going into it. We build all of that here. And um, thank God we did, because with the chip shortage, it would have been just an absolute nightmare because we basically had to redesign a lot of boards because we couldn't get chips. So what we decided to do is go ahead and take advantage of that and um, build state-of-the-art system, EtherCAD control system. So that's what you've got right there. One of the best uh, control systems in the world. Um, there's really nobody that I know of that can beat it. I know some big companies are matching it, but they can't beat it. Now this one here obviously doesn't have the gantry they're putting it on. So let me flip the camera around here. Okay. Alrighty, it turns out it was just easier for me to come down here back to the machine instead of trying to um, turn the camera around. So here I am in front of the XR6 again. Anyway, let's talk about two more things real quick and I'll let you go. One of the, I tried to answer as many questions as I could. That's why the video I think is going to be over an hour long. Um, we just had a lot of questions. A lot of people have been asking us. So I tried to cover most of them. One of the big questions, of course, is what are your lead times? And I would say right now that we've got production under control pretty good. We were able to procure enough chips to build 540 machines. That should hold us over for a year and a half or so. And um, obviously you can't foresee things like steel shortages or stuff like that. But the hard to get parts, it seems that we have overcome that hurdle. So I would guess lead times as of today before we introduce the drill head is about four weeks, I'm guessing, right in that ballpark, give or take a little bit, but right at about four weeks is what we are trying our hardest to maintain. We're actually trying to beat that, but I think four, three to four weeks is probably the best we could do right now. Um, when the drill head comes out, all bets are off. 
we just have a tremendous number of people waiting on that one feature. And when it comes out, I don't know what's going to happen. However, um, over the next month, we are also um, going to be implementing new procedures, trying to increase production even further. So maybe it'll stay around four weeks. Okay, one other thing I'd like to mention. A lot of people come in and pick our machines up. They're extremely happy with them, and we hear it all the time. I almost didn't buy your machine because you were cheaper than the next guy. And sometimes we were significantly cheaper. We're talking twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars cheaper. To that, you know, their response, of course, is or their thinking is, you get what you pay for. And, and a lot of times that's true. However, it isn't true if another company is basically trying to get everything they can out of you you know, what the market will bear type philosophy. At JD Squared, we have a much fairer pricing policy. We're looking for a fair day's pay for a fair day's work building one of the world's best machines, and that's how we work here at JD Squared. I believe we accomplished that. So if you think that you're looking at a machine that's thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 more than this one, I highly recommend come to the factory. Take a look at how we build it. Look at the quality. Bring some parts with you. Let's cut some stuff up and give us an opportunity to prove to you that this very well could be the best machine in the world. Also, maybe take a trip to the other factories, see what they've got. I feel pretty confident that we'll come out ahead on that. So um, as far as pricing goes, you know, be careful what, what you're looking at. You really want to put eyes on things. That's why I tried to give you as much information as I could in the video showing you under the covers and all so that you could basically tell we haven't got a bunch of uh, you know, sheet metal that we bolted together and try to fashion some kind of cutter out of. Anyway, um, I think that's pretty much it. I apologize for the link, and, but I really appreciate you tuning in. If we if we can answer any more questions, please email or call. Um, calling's a little bit hard right now. We're down to one tech. You know how it is. You can't get anybody to work anymore. Well, they're working. You just can't get anybody to fill jobs. So. Um, if you email, they could probably answer the questions or call sales. Anyway, once again, I really appreciate you taking your time out and viewing the video. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day. Goodbye.